Good morning, good morning, good morning, y'all. It is Thursday. Welcome to Coffee Chats with Coach Candy. We have been on a roll this week with some great discussion around boundaries and relationships and codependency and those threads that sometimes we're not aware of that are creating uh, those codependent relationships. Good morning, Deborah. Good morning, Shirley. So everybody, cheers. Grab your coffee, grab your water, grab your juice, grab your tea, grab whatever it is that gets you fired up, gets you hydrated, gets you rocking and rolling because we are going to continue to have some really good conversation this morning. Morning. Uh, how's everybody doing? We're going to give everybody a minute to get on here. Um, it's a little sticky this morning in Austin. Uh, I took Peyton out for a walk and uh, I think it was supposed to rain last night. Good morning, Robin. And it didn't rain last night. So um, it is excessively humid uh, this morning in Austin, which is not common. And uh, I took Peyton out for a walk this morning and my ankles were chewed up. The grass mites are pretty uh, ferocious this morning. So two seconds outside and I have like connect the dots across my ankles. A bug bites, which is awesome. I forgot to spray this morning. So anyway, that's how I got to start my morning. Uh, definitely awake now as the little itch and pain is uh, kicking in. Good morning, Yvette. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? We've had some big conversation this week. So before we continue um, the conversation, um, I want to see where everybody's at. Ah, yes. Okay, Shirley. Empath leads to codependency. Explain. Um, I don't know if I believe that that's true. I think that empaths have sometimes some risk when it comes to creating hello, how it comes to creating those codependent threads, an empath that is uh, able to stand in a space to protect their energy, um, there isn't risk for them to get in a codependent relationship. Codependency is when you are overly excessively sacrificing. And today I'm going to talk about some of those symptoms and signs. I do think if one, you're not aware that you're an empath, um, or you don't know how to manage your energy that yes, I think that you have some susceptibility to get caught up in those threads uh, for codependency because you are someone who feels for everyone else. And sometimes as an empath, I know being a deep empath myself, and I can tell the difference when I'm not protecting my energy, I can get so caught up in other people's energy that I mask it or, or, or believe it's actually mine, which then creates a space where I am creating excessive sacrifice. I am so concerned about the other person. I've almost removed myself from my own being and body, and I've interjected myself in trying to fix something for someone else. So if you get into that space as an empath and you're, you're trying to fix it, you're trying to take on all of that energy and not being able to delineate or distinguish between, um, yes, I think there's some risk for you um, to fall into some of those codependent patterns, um, relationships, and have those threads through. Um, as we go through this morning, because uh, yesterday we got into such a rich discussion that we didn't get a chance to talk about the actual symptoms um, and ways that codependency can show up. Today, I want to make sure that we get into that so that you have that with the conversation that we've been having all week. So surely, hopefully some of that will answer that question as well. Um, if there's more questions in that, please um, let me know and we'll kind of dig that back. But I'm not sure if that answered your question um, or not. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so let's get into that a little bit. How's everybody doing? Like I said, we had a, and thank you, Shirley, for that. Thank you for kicking that off this morning with the question. How's everybody doing? We've had some big conversation, and yesterday got really deep, really fast, and um, feel like, and, and I don't know if anybody saw my post on Instagram, I just feel like something channeled through me yesterday as I do most days, but yesterday was really big, and the, the interaction and the questions you guys had um, were very thought-provoking. There was a lot inside of that, and so I want to make sure that everybody's okay um, from that because we did hit on some things that could have opened up some awareness for you, could have opened up some triggers for you. Just want to see if there's any questions or anything that's still kind of unsure um, before we get moving forward. Because like I said, today I want to talk more about what are some of the signs and symptoms of codependent relationships. And I want to talk about the different types of boundaries that we set sometimes. And uh, Sometimes they're healthy boundaries and sometimes they're not healthy boundaries. And so I want to give you those tools so that you have those. Um, since we're getting into such a good conversation, I want to make sure you have what you need um, to move this forward, to create some of that awareness for yourself and 
start to break down or clear out some of those codependent relationships where you can. So I will allow you guys to let you just keep uh, putting some things in. But in the meantime, let's talk about um, the six. I think there's six. One, two, three, four. Actually, there's more than that. Let me get into that first and then ask the six questions. So some of the symptoms that might show up um, from a codependency standpoint, one is especially when you're in relationship with certain people, if you have an excessively low self-esteem, if you find yourself always questioning your value, if you find yourself always thinking the worst of yourself, if you find yourself, by the way, this is also some symptoms of being around a narcissist, um, so just know that it could be either or both going on. And sometimes we do have very deep codependent relationships with narcissists um, in our lives. Um, I know watching that, both experiencing that from my dad and watching the relationship between my mom and my dad, there was a huge codependent relationship and my dad was about the extreme narcissist of all narcissists. Um, even the military clinically diagnosed my father as a narcissist, which I think is uh, extremely telling. So anyway, um, I want you to think about uh, doing well, kind of off topic, but yesterday I complimented someone on their nice shirt. The lady had a cute top on. Then just three minutes later, another lady complimented my shoes. Now y'all know I'm not talking about clothes. That's hilarious. I love that. I love that we can, you know, put that out there, especially in some of the light, in light of some of the conversations that we had, being able to step forward and offer that kindness and compassion. That's always um, a great thing to share. So thank you, you guys. I love that. Um, so I want you to think about, are there people in your life that, you, when you're around them, you feel like your self-esteem goes down. You feel like you're always questioning yourselves. You feel like no matter what you do, you're not good enough. You feel like you're seeking their validation um, on every level. And if they say anything that's not praising you, you do kind of the spiral downward um, and allow all of that to be something that you're internalizing. That's a really clear sign that there's something wrong in the relationship, whether it's they're a narcissist and just get you're getting absorbed in that or you have that codependent thread that's going on, you're putting so much power in how you believe that person is valuing you instead of being able to reclaim that for yourself. And so um, usually there's an underlying um, subconscious feeling of shame, of guilt. Um, there's a need for perfectionism inside of there. So think about where you may have, good morning, Carol, that need to always be pleasing, that need to, which is the next one, right? The next symptom is people pleasing, P excessively people pleasing. So you are going above and beyond in every capacity. You are self-sacrificing to almost the detriment or sometimes to the detriment of your own mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, and energetic health. Um, you are in a place where you're giving, 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 and if anyone asks you to do anything, you're like, yes, yes, yes. You are people pleasing to the point where you are exhausted, you are burnt out. And so those two things really play hand in hand, that space of having low self-esteem and that place of um, really having that excessive need for people pleasing. And there's a lot of self-sacrificing that goes in that. So I want you to think about those two for just a moment. as I get some coffee in me, yay. So I want you to think about if you have a hard time, if you really struggle with saying no to anyone, if you really struggle with saying no to certain people, no is a powerful ownership word. And I get, and especially women have a really hard time. We have been taught to be people pleasing. We have been taught and I want you to think about the generational legacies that we've been handed down. Um, we talked about that yesterday. Women couldn't even vote till 1920, right? There's been this training, this conditioning, this programming for lifetimes around women's role in the family, women's role um, with their spouse. Um, men have the other side of it where it's not showing emotions. It's different things around there. And there's relationships that we've been taught or codependent threats that we've been taught based on you know our historical legacies our, our, our generation the handing down of this belief and so women oftentimes are taught to be people pleasing you know you're supposed to look pretty you're supposed to look nice all these things I mean just stupid stuff I heard growing up and unfortunately still see that showing up a lot um, in certain areas of the country and certain cultures. Um, so when you think about that, do you have certain people that you really struggle that you've never been able to say no to? Um, that is a sign that there is something 
not working in that relationship, that there's a sign that there's a, there's a potential codependent thread. Um, because when you can't say no, you don't feel like you have a voice. You have really low esteem, self-esteem. There's guilt. There's shame. Um, there's this space of not feeling worthy because owning your no is a space of knowing your worthiness. And no is really kind. And, and I know a lot of people are really afraid to say no. And they're afraid, what if I disappoint people? And remember the quote from Brene Brown that says, daring to set boundaries is about having courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing others. And the thing is, is everybody's afraid that they're going to hurt someone's feelings or disappoint someone when they say no. And what happens, and I was just having a conversation with a client of mine yesterday about this. She's like, I actually think my team and my partners are respecting me more because I set boundaries. I'm like, of course they are. We are all overgrown children. And I'll give you a really clear example. I, uh, one summer, my 16, when I was 16, um, I had planned on having a pretty light summer. I was working already as an assistant manager at an ice cream shop in town that was in a little strip center that's not even there anymore. Um, it was a little uh, shop over um, on the other side of town from where the Dairy Queen was. And um, I was the assistant manager running that space um, that summer. And so I had a job. I was planning on laying by the pool all summer. It was a nighttime, you know, easy peasy, right? My mom called me one day and she said, hey, her friend Joni, she just found out her babysitter took her kids across state line. She's freaking out. She just fired her. She has no one to watch her kids. Well, let me preface this by saying her children were holy terror demon children. Um, she had a four and an eight year, seven year old. And they were like hellions. I love kids. They were hellions. And part of it's because they had zero discipline. They were allowed to stay up all night. They could crash on the living room floor so they wouldn't go to bed till like 1130 midnight watching TV. Then when their parents got up to get ready for work at 6, 630, they were up. So when these kids weren't getting enough sleep, they were completely no discipline. Their house was a total train wreck. And my mom asked me, she's like, would you consider watching the kids this summer. And I'm like, no, I really don't have any interest. And my mom's like, really? She's got no one. She knows you're responsible. Candy, would you be interested? I'm like, man, I was planning on sitting by now at the same time, knowing that the reason, whole reason I was working is I was paying my way through college, other things. And so me making money was a really big deal, especially back then with things going on in my family. And so I said, okay, I will, I'll go do this. So I go over there and, um, you know, the two kids are, are, are in space and, um, Day one, the interaction with these two kids and the language, the four-year-old dropping F-bombs and telling me she's not doing things and being very clear and adamant. And it got to the point where, I mean, just temper tantrums the first morning. And um, I was already just like at the end of my at the end of my rope on this. And so I was like, Cassie, you're going to take a nap. I want to go down with lunch. Because, you know, I was like, okay, bring your plates to the sink. Dale, who was like seven, I'm like, put them in the dishwasher, this, this, and that. And of course, got fought. They fought me the whole time. They're like, we don't put our dishes away. I'm like, well, you do when I'm here. I'm just going to make that very clear, right? And so um, I was like, Cassie, you're going to take a nap. She, I don't take naps. I'm like, okay, great. And you're going to take a nap. So she's like, well, I'm calling my mom. I'm like, you call your mom all day long. And so I get on the phone with Joni, and Joni's like, you know, Candy, Cassie doesn't take naps. And I will tell you, I was even clear about some of my boundaries back then. I remember saying this. I was 16, and I said to Joni, I said, I'm under the ink. I'm under the understanding that you don't have anybody else to watch your kids if I decide to say no. She's like, yes. And I said, so I'm going to put it, I'm going to make it very clear. Either your daughter, your four-year-old daughter takes a nap or I'm not coming back tomorrow. And Joni kind of got quiet on the phone and she said, put Cassie back on the phone. And next thing I know, Cassie's like all crying. She's like, I can't believe I'm going to take a nap. So she fought me for the first couple days. Within a week, the change in the child was like drastic where she was happier, she was healthier. I even got the seven-year-old to start taking a nap. They weren't getting enough sleep at night. Then they started learning that when they were done with the toy, they put a toy away, when they're done with their dishes. And it got to the point where Joni came home one night, she was, oh my God, my house has never been so clean. And my kids are like, I said, because every child, and even the owner, overgrown child in all of us, needs structure, needs boundaries, needs discipline, and needs clear expectations. So when we do that for ourselves and we provide that for others and are clear, we allow people to show up at their best and highest value. And I don't care if it's a child, I don't care if it's your business partner, I don't care if it's your client. When you are consistent and clear, or clear and consistent, 
know that you are doing them a service. It is kind when you are clear. It is unkind when you're not. And when you teach people how to work with you, how to engage with you, what your boundaries are, you then teach them how to respect you. You teach them how to respect themselves. You teach them how to do the same thing. And every human being is wired for a understanding and knowledge. And here's the thing, structure, framework, systems. While they can be limiting when they're done from an ego space to control, they can be freeing and they're absolutely necessary when we need to play to our highest and best level. Because every one of us has a need for safety and boundaries done in the right way create safe environments. They create safe containers. They create a space where I can be honest and say, thank you for asking me that. My answer is no. And understand that that is being kind, that that will be received. Understand that we all have that need. And so I share that story because it doesn't matter if you're four or seven or if you're 40 or 70. We all need and crave boundaries that make us feel safe. And when you don't know what is safe for you and what is not, you are allowing these threads of codependency to drive, which has you feeling drained, which has your self-esteem feeling low, which has you people pleasing. And those are just two of the first symptoms. So let me see what you guys are saying here now. Uh, Yvette, I think I can truly say I am not a people pleaser. Awesome. <laughs> Saying no comes very easy to me, but I don't have kids and I'm not married. So I don't have a family that I might feel I need to put first. You know, that's true. And I also want to caution you not to make the comparison. Well, I don't have this, so therefore not. Because there's people that have families that also know how to say no well, that have boundaries. Um, we just, it depends on our environments. We all have different things pushing on us. And so I think to be able to own that fact that you're like, no comes very easily to me. I'm not a people pleaser. Awesome. And we're going to talk about some other potential signs that might show up to show you where there might be some um, threads. And maybe there's not. And not everybody has these deep embedded codependent relationships it's for those people that do whether you're seeing it in people that you love or for yourself and again it might be in how you're using your calendar it might be what your expectation it's the need for perfectionism those are creating um, some of that cycle that's not healthy and that's actually um, creating that space of debilitation for those buckets of your mental emotional physical spiritual and energetic health um, no is an empowering it is empowering and liberating absolutely and when you get comfortable saying no and here's the thing you can say no thank you you can say wow I'm really honored that you asked right now I have something that came through that's a huge opportunity for me and the truth of the matter is I have to say no because I already have something else um, committed for that day and as much as it's a high ticket high paying I am not about to, to shift my integrity and move something because I'm not available and to say no is empowering um, because there's also the chance they might move it if they really want me to be the person that's there um, there's opportunities around that and so knowing and understanding no is one of the most powerful words we have in our English language when used effectively. Knowing when and how to say yes and no, and know that both of them are complete sentences is in incredible personal power, and it's a space of empowerment for sure. Um, Robin, no trouble setting boundaries or saying no, awesome, but do it with consideration. Absolutely. All of this is not to say you've gotta be out there being some kind of jerk. It's to say you're doing this with compassion, kindness, and grace. And when you do this knowing that you can't put 100% in when someone asks you, you're being kind to say, I don't wanna half-ass it. I respect and honor you so much, I don't wanna show up halfway with you. And right now, this is not something I can take on. Thank you for asking me. I'm deeply honored and my answer is no, I can't do this right now. That is so kind. That is coming from such a place to say I honor you too much to half ass because I know that I can't play full out in that space right now. Awesome. Uh, you've got structures and boundaries. We all need it. Every one of us. It creates safety and it's one of our fundamental needs as human beings is to know that we're safe. Absolutely. Um, have missed chats this week with a busy schedule. Enjoy the conversation. Must head out. Absolutely, Robin. I hope you can catch the other ones. We've had some really good conversations this morning. Uh, you bet. We need to know what the rules of the game are. Absolutely. My job might be my codependent partner, Cy. Yeah, so let's talk about some other symptoms that come up. So there's the low self-esteem. There's people-pleasing. Poor boundaries. This is where you have sort of this imaginary line between you and others. 
Um, and it not it applies to your body, money, belongings, your feelings, thoughts, and needs. And so we need to have those boundaries. And sometimes we have blurry or weak boundaries. And I want to show, tell you some of the potential boundaries. We can have soft boundaries, which is a person with soft boundary merges with other people's boundaries, which means there's not a clear delineation. Someone with a soft boundary is easily a victim of psychological manipulation. So where do you have soft, soft boundaries that are blurred into or merged with someone else? Because oftentimes there's a codependent thread there. The other type of boundary is what's known as a spongy boundary. A person with spongy boundaries is like a combination of having soft and rigid boundaries. This, they, permer, they permit less emotional contingent than soft boundaries, but more than those with rigid. So they sort of vacillate between both spaces. People with spongy boundaries are unsure of what to let in and what to keep out. So oftentimes they're inconsistent in terms of the boundaries that they've set. Sometimes they're like, oh, non-negotiable, and other times they sort of cave, right? So they kind of vacillate in that space. Then you get people that are rigid with their, their boundaries. A person with rigid boundaries is closed or walled off and oftentimes has a fixed mindset. So nobody can get close physically or emotionally. So they have just shut down. They're like, nope, non-negotiable. No one's getting in. I am not. I'm just not going there. Absolutely done with this conversation. Game over. This is often the case if someone has been the victim of physical, emotional, psychological, or sexual abuse. Rigid boundaries can be selective, which depend on time, place, or circumstances, and are usually based on a bad previous experience in similar situations. So they are, have conditioned themselves to say, I've experienced this, so every time this comes up, I'm just gonna shut down. Because I know that they have an assumption that they make that says, I know that this is gonna happen over and over again, so I'm just not even gonna allow myself to go there. Then there's flexible boundaries, similar to spongy, rigid boundaries, but the person exercises more control. The person decides what to let in and what to keep out, is resistant to emotional contingent and psychological manipulation, and is difficult to exploit. This is a person that knows the bandwidth of where their boundaries need to reach, when to get rigid to say non-negotiable, when to say, okay, I'm willing to open this up, perhaps compromise, perhaps look at it from a different perspective, and they're in constant flow in the boundaries that they have. And so thinking about what boundaries you have, do you have poor boundaries, especially if you have soft boundaries or spongy boundaries where you're, you're inconsistent, or you're blurred into someone else's boundaries where there's not really a delineation about what you need and what's safe for you and what's not. Um, this is an example of where there might be a codependent thread. Another one is reactivity. So are you constantly reacting instead of pausing and responding? There is a big difference in reacting and responding responding is that space of listening with an open heart, right? Responding is that space to be vulnerable. Reacting is I heard something and bam, I'm ready to be in fight or flight mode or freeze mode for that matter. Reacting is I already have a perceived outcome and I'm either going to protect myself, I'm either going to fight this or I'm just going to shut it down. And so when you react, you're already charged in the space. And again, if you find yourself always reacting, to someone or something, whether it's your work, whether it's your calendar, whether it's another person, if you find yourself always in a reactionary, and you know it, it's a contracted space in your body. You can feel it. It brings you in and it makes you like, mm, right? If that's the feeling you're getting every time you're around someone or a situation, there is a potential codependent thread inside of that. Caretaking. Are you excessively needing to take care of other people? Are you always, and this is someone that has poor boundaries, this is the difference between empathy and sympathy. And so, surely when you ask that question, this is where you need to have clear boundaries because what happens is empaths oftentimes allow themselves to get into the sympathy game, which is an enabling space. It's a space where we think we have to fix it, we have to caretake, we have to take on the whole world, we're here to be the savior. That's not, like I said yesterday, that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is not in fixing other people. Our responsibility is helping other people see their own power and their own greatness and help them take responsibility in that space. Um, and oftentimes we do that by what we model 
Um, we do that by the containers in the space that we hold for them. And we do that by holding them accountable um, to things that they say they're going to do um, to keep them in integrity for themselves. Um, the other space, and this is where I had to really do some work, was the need for control. Where in your relationships do you have the space that you feel you have to control the relationship, control the conversation, control the activity or the outcome? Um, this is a huge sign of codependency, those threads running through your relationships. Do you feel like you need to, um, because control helps those in codependent relationships feel safe and secure. So when you are obsessive about needing control in your life, in your relationships, there is more than likely a codependent thread going on there. And so for me, that was a big one as I started to do this work because I was, uh, as I say, recovering control freak these days. Um, you wouldn't want to live in, you don't like uncertainty. It's not, you want chaos. You want everything to have a certain order. You control the limits. Um, control limits your ability to take risks, share feelings. I was very controlled in my emotions for a really long time um, to the point where I was almost shut down. I just believe that if I didn't talk about what was going on, that I would, you know, I, I wasn't a victim. And what I didn't realize is I was creating a different kind of victim space because I wouldn't talk about what was going on and I wouldn't allow myself to ask for help. And I, I didn't want that space of emotional turbulence and emotional up and down and all of that stuff. And so that need for control, um, and oftentimes that's a violation of someone else's boundary. So I want you to think about that too, right? Um, Mm, you are touching on some things. I try, Yvette. I try. Um, just functional communication is another symptom. So this is when you are trying to communicate your thoughts, your feelings, your needs. Um, if you are, you're afraid to be truthful because you don't want to upset someone. Instead of saying, I don't like that, you might pretend it's okay. So think about, this is a huge one in business and corporate. This is where groupthink comes in. By the way, groupthink is very codependent. Red. Joe, so if you're in the space of you really want to say something in a meeting and instead you're like, mm -hmm, okay, I agree. And then either you having the hallway conversation when you leave, which is like, that was crap. I think that's ridiculous that we're going down that path. That just means more work on our plate. And or if you're just sitting there and having resentment, whatever, know that that's a, a potential codependent thread. Because when you have that space of dysfunctional communication, that passive aggressive behavior where you say one thing and you mean something else because you are afraid to use your voice, this is such a problem. Passive aggressive codependency is such a problem, especially in the corporate space. It is not... <laughs> yeah, hey, another damn you candy for today. I think I'm up to five this week. I love it. Um, actually, I got a couple yesterday. I think I'm closer to like seven or eight. And I love it. It's It makes me so happy. In fact, I had some people yesterday like, you are so, I'm like, I know, it's actually, I love it. I love damn you candy brew. Um, but I want you to think about that, just functional communication. If you are saying one thing and actually mean something else or want to say something else, know that there is something <laughs> for you to take some ownership in there. And this is one of the biggest problems in our families, in our work environments, is this dysfunctional communication that is a very heavy passive aggressive codependent thread. Obsessions. So let's talk about your tendency to spend time thinking about other people in relationships. How often do you, how much time do you spend obsessing over something someone said to you or what you think they think of you or what you think they're going to do if you say this? How much worry, by the way, worry is not an emotion. Worry is a mindset. How much energy, time, obsessive, compulsive worry are you putting out based on what somebody said to you, how you think someone's going to react, that is a very big sign of there being some codependent threads um, inside of this, especially, excuse me, if you beat yourself up over your mistakes and over things such as that. Um, dependency. So the codependency, there's a dependency space in it, right? They need other people to make them feel okay. 
you are looking for external validation. You are looking for someone to fix it for you. Um, huge, I have some clients that really need to work on this. They want other people to fix it for them. They Sometimes I have people that don't want to get into their emotions, and I have other people that get excessively emotional so that other people will hug them and take care of them and do whatever. There's a dependency in that. You are looking for someone to fix it for you um, so that you don't have to take responsibility. So another symptom, denial. Denial, it's not a river, right? Denial. <laughs> um, this is when you are not facing the truth of what's going on. So for some of you right now that are like, wow, I don't have codependent relationships, are is that truth? Or are you in denial right now? Um, because when we don't acknowledge what's going on, and again, Shirley, this even goes back to your question around how does an empath deal with this? If you are in denial about how we're showing up in that space, you are not allowing yourself to create what you need to protect yourself, to protect your energy, and to separate yourself out of what you're taking on from another person and um, what you're putting out that's your energy um, and creating those clean lines in between. Um, the last two are pain, uh, problems with intimacy. Do you have problems having intimate relationships with people in your life? And I don't just mean from a sexual standpoint. I mean from a deeply connected. Do you have walls? Do you have um, an inability to get vulnerable um, with people that mean the most to you or what you, who you think means the most to you because you're trying to protect yourself at all costs? When you are not allowing yourself to be vulnerable, when you're not allowing yourself to be intimate, um, there's a sign that there's a codependent relationship there. Again, it's that passive aggressive space. You're not speaking what's in your heart. You're not speaking true. Okay, definitely have some of the symptoms. Yeah, I'm still working on some of them. I mean, please, work in progress. Remember that, people. Um, and then painful emotions. Codependency creates stress and leads to painful emotions. Shame, low self-esteem, they create anxiety, fear. They start creating worry, feelings of being judged, rejected, abandoned, making mistakes, being a failure, feeling trapped, or being closed off by someone. Um, anger, resentment, depression. So ask yourself, if you're feeling any of those contracted feelings around someone in your life, <laughs> Another deep damn you can't even I love it. Um, if you are feeling constricted, if you are feeling in a contracted, if you are feeling any of those low vibration energies around somebody and their consistent low energies, there is more than likely a thread or more of codependency running between you and that other person. And there's an opportunity for you to get really honest because you're probably in some form of denial about what's going on in that relationship. And whether it be your work, whether it be your calendar, whether it be um, your family, your friends, your community, whatever it might be, where are you being passive aggressive? Where are you being contracted? And so these are the six questions I'm going to leave you with to think about. And you might have to rewind this to go back um, to hear these questions again, because you might want to write these down and journal on these. The first question is, does your sense of purpose involve making extreme sacrifices to, sat to satisfy someone else's needs? So does your sense of purpose involve extreme sex satisfaction? Cancel clear. Let me try that again. Does your need of purpose involve making extreme sacrifices to satisfy someone else's needs? Okay, so that's the first question I want you to lean into. The second question is, is it difficult to say no when someone makes demands on your time and energy? Is it difficult for you to say no and think about work environments in particular when someone demands on your time and energy? Number three, do you cover someone else's problems with drug, alcohol, or law, the law itself, things that they're doing that are, you know, against the law, whatever. Are you covering up in any way, shape, or form? And I would say even more than drugs and alcohol, are you covering up for people who have addictive behaviors, whether it's they're overeating, whether it is they're excessively mean, whether or not they're narcissistic, whether they're shopaholics, whether they're, you know, whatever it is, are you constantly finding yourself covering up for behaviors of others? Um, whether it be abusive behavior and how they speak to people, bullying behavior, narcissistic behavior, uh, food, alcohol, drug addictive behavior, um, breaking the law behavior, um, stealing money behavior, whatever it is, are you covering up for anybody in that space? Uh, four, 
Do you constantly worry about others' opinions of you? Are you always internalizing what you think other people are um, judging you on? Do you constantly worry about others' opinions of you? Five, do you feel trapped in any of your relationships? Is there any relationship in your life? And this, again, could be your work, could be your calendar, could be whatever. Do you have a sense of feeling trapped? And then the last one, this goes back to the dysfunctional communications. Do you keep quiet to avoid arguments? Do you resist conflict at all costs? Without conflict, there is no communication. I just want to be really clear about that. Without conflict, we all come from different perspectives, different experiences, different things. Are you avoiding conversations? Are you avoiding conflict? Are you avoiding, avoiding spaces where people are at because you would rather not be there because you don't want to have to say something? Are you keeping quiet to avoid arguments and conflict? So those are the six questions I want to leave you with. Thoughts, how you guys doing? Um, this kind of brings our conversation on what we've been talking about this week um, somewhat to a close. I'm sure we'll bring more of this um, to the conversation. I'm hoping this has been helpful for you, eye-opening, um, an opportunity for you to lean in. Like I said, I'm a work in progress. Do I have this all figured out? Hell no. Uh, do I have some spaces where I have to constantly be mindful and present about the level and quality of the relationships that I have? A thousand percent yes. Um, and have I done a lot of work to clear out some of those codependent threads? Yes, and I honor that as well. And um, I had a lot of codependent threads, especially as a child growing up with my family dynamics. A lot of us have been taught those tendencies um, in those environments. We're in survival mode. We're doing what we can. Um, and many of us have also been taught those in our work environments, especially if you've played in the corporate environment the way that I did 20 years in that environment. Um, there's a lot of codependent um, relationships, passive aggressiveness, need for clearer boundaries. And it's amazing how much resistance I get when people start talking about boundaries, that when they actually start to implement them and hold them, how they really are able to reclaim their voice and their power. And so that is my wish and desire for all of you is that, oh, awesome, thank you, Yvette, is that you are finding a way um, to honor the boundaries that you need. All of this discussion is for you to get clearer on what's okay for you, what's not okay for you, what's safe for you, and what's not safe for you. And to be really clear about how to establish those boundaries, stay consistent in those boundaries, and articulate your expectations around those boundaries. And again, the healthier space for your boundaries is that flexible space where you know that you are creating those boundaries for those situations and experiences and you're very clear on who you are and what you're willing to give and what you're willing not to give um, and you can move in that dance and stay in flow. So that's what I got for y'all. Carol, our previous employer was a chronic source of codependency, especially in that passive aggressive way. Yes, I would agree, because they were extremely not willing to come to the table and deal with conflict. Um, there was a surface, even before all the culture changed there, where it was very you know, open, family oriented, everybody loved, and there was this deep seated passive aggressive culture underneath that. So yes, completely agree with that. Um, yeah, I've been in environments where it's very aggressive and bully, and then been in some very deep passive aggressive and I will say that sometimes as much as I'm I, neither work but sometimes it's easier to deal with the bullying the, the straight out aggressive energy than it is that underlying manipulative passive aggressive somebody says something one thing and they're super sweet and kind to your face and then they freaking cut you out at the knees I would rather somebody scream at me to my face and like do what they got to do so that at least I can decide how I want to respond versus thinking that something that was said here, it's one of the things that happens in clicks, right? Something said here, but then there's this whole unwinding and unraveling that happens here. Passive, and, and it's such a Midwest culture thing too. Um, passive aggressive behavior for me is the most, um, is the ickiest of all because there's this deep emotional manipulation. There's this whole not knowing where you stand. And I think that's a lot of where the codependent relationships truly come from is that space of exactly what you're talking about, um, Carol, that space of codependency, especially in that passive aggressive way. So be mindful of where that's showing up. And here's the thing. 
be mindful around your responsibility and your role in that space because the only way you create effective change is for you to change how you're showing up and to be very clear about what boundaries you need um, in that environment. So again, everybody, thank you. Thank you for weighing in. What a great conversation this week. Um, Hope you all have a fantastic Thursday. I'm about to head out to go work with some clients this morning. Uh, so I hope you all um, show up powerfully, passionately, passionately and purposely today. Um, and um, hopefully there's some opportunity for you to do some reflection and um, some things that opened up your eyes to say, hmm, maybe there's some opportunity for me there. And that's all I'm trying to do. I have no idea what we're going to talk about tomorrow, but I'll be back tomorrow at 730 uh, Central Time AM. And then um, let me know if anything's showing up as you're going through some of this. Just message me, drop a note in the, um, in the, on the page or in the thread, and uh, I will respond as soon as I can. So with that, everybody, I love you. And I uh, hope you have an amazing Thursday. I'll talk to you soon.